Good evening, YouTubers. Welcome to episode 41 of Sugar Shoe TV. Hope you've had a great week. I've had a fairly productive week. I've been all over. I've been down south to see uh, Mike and his imp with the oil leak, the new engine. So I've uh, been and fixed that, hopefully. Um, done a bit of a chat about the 1150 that we saw the crankshaft on last week. So that's now been in the dyno and run. Got involved with a bit of a uh, talk about compression ratio. So I've done all that. Hopefully you'll enjoy what you're seeing and uh, come back to see some more next week. Now, uh, also, there's a possibility that we're going to Bradford tomorrow night for the Formula One stock car. So I'll try and get a bit of video footage from there as well. I'll tag it on the end. And uh, yeah, it's been a good week. This is Benoit's engine. Obviously, it's got new liners in now. Did a bit about that. So going to hopefully get that built early part of next week. And uh, we'll get on the dyno again. Right. Have a great week. Cheers for now. Bye bye. Good morning, YouTubers. This is the 1150 of Peter's that we're going to try and get the dyno this week and run and uh, first thing I've come to do I've got a problem so I thought I'd share it with you now because this engine is a, what we call an old school 1150 it's got a stroked crankshaft so the crank has got an offset grind on it to give it a little bit more throw just get that extra capacity but because it's got more throw they have to put a spacer plate between the head and the block so I've come to put um, the, the timing chain on that was supplied with the engine for me to build and unfortunately no matter what i do i can't get it to stretch far enough so very luckily i've had loads of timing chains made and i have one here which is an 83 link so that's an 82 that's 83 so hopefully with the 83 link chain we'll be able to get it to stretch and this will this band this is this is what controls the chain tension Hopefully that band will work in the correct area and everything will be good. Okay, we we'll just put the new 83 link chain on and I'm very, very pleased to say it's in its perfect position that. So you can see the tension on the on the blade there by the spring and we've got play as well. Now if I, if I, if I zoom in, you'll see how the slide works. Can you see the slide there? And there's a, this little bit of braise at the top is a stop that gets brazed in so as the uh, engine expands and, and contracts with the heat we have a little bit of movement there for the chain to obviously go uh, tighter as the, as the block grows basically <coughs> so and the reason we put that stop in as well is because if for any reason the engine runs backwards instead of it being able to uh, climb on the next tooth and, and jump and jump on the on the chain it can't do that because it's mechanically locked so it can go forwards or backwards no problem so that's that's pleasing that something's going well I'm good start to monday morning okay just coming to put the um cam carrier back together i just checked the shim clearances just made a couple of adjustments just to make it how i'd like it a couple of closed up and i thought what i just talked to you for a second now back in the day this was called a hartwell 410 cam I should say 410 on the end as in yeah h410 so that was a 410 valve lift now most imps only ran 360 valve lift at the time so this was proper you know this was the, the, the bee's knees so what they did because they didn't really have the um i mean this this actually got steel cam followers in it now but back in the day when this was made i'd imagine they were still running the chill cast followers so in, in an attempt to make them work what they did was if you look can you see how the head has been machined and the carrier is deeper so it's called the deep carrier and the idea was that when the bucket was on full lift it was still supported by the carrier and, and then obviously the head was machined to take the carrier beautiful bit of engineering look at that absolutely lovely so uh, we'll get the cam in we'll get it timed up next and then we'll hopefully get the sump on today and uh, get ready to run it later in the week little uh, trick here for lining up the gasket to the port so this is a new inlet exhaust manifold gasket and i can feel that the gasket is encroaching on the top of the inlet port there so very very gently rather than messing around with engineers blue we just get a hammer the ball end of a hammer and just gently tap the outside edge of the of the gasket and what that does is it leaves a witness mark so I can take the gasket over to the uh, Erdy Gurdy. 
can you see there you go it's a good example so all i've got to do is remove that overhang and the gasket will be a perfect match to the head then okay youtubers we're just about to uh put this on the dyno and run it and i thought oh well i've got my new whiteboard we'll have a bit of a chat about static and dynamic compression ratios just for five minutes so if you're educated please don't watch this bit just go make a brew because uh I probably end up tying myself in knots but i was fascinated because normally on a long stroke engine like this the compression ratio is a bit lower sort of 11 and a half and when i came to cc it just so i got an idea where to start with the advance on the dyno it ended up coming out at 12.5 to 1 compression i thought crikey that's a high static compression and then i looked at the cam and i measured the lift at top dead and i thought oh right well the, the inlet valve is going to be open for a long time after the bottom dead center. So that will reduce the uh, the dynamic compression ratio. So then I thought, hmm, should we make a video touching on, now I've got my new whiteboard, about static and dynamic compression ratio. And I thought, yeah, we'll, we'll do a video. I'm a bit nervous because it's the first time I've done it, but if you never practice anything, you'll never get any better. So I'll do my best to explain it in simple terms. Now, looking at the diagram here, you can see we've got a TDC figure. So that's the piston at the top. This is the piston at the bottom. I'll just zoom out. And this is the piston when the uh, actually is actually squashing because the inlet valve is closed. Now I'll come to all that in a minute. The basics of what I'm trying to say is the compression ratio is defined by the amount of cc's of fluid you can get into the chamber at TDC so when a piston's at the top it's the amount of times that is squashed into that and that gives you a ratio of say like 12.5 to 1 like our engine is here and that's what we call a static compression ratio so it's not taking into account any valve timing figures so if you look it's dead easy that's the bottom dead center so you've got all that being squashed into that 12 point so look if you look we simply do an equation it's 1150cc is the engine. It's got four cylinders. Just to, to find out one cylinder, we divide it by four. That gives us 287.5 cc's. You add the 24.9, which is what's in the top at TDC, to the 287. That gives you 312. And then to find out one, you divide it by the, the uh, 24.9 uh, again. And that gives us a ratio of 12.54 to one. Now, what the point of what i'm trying to come to is i've tried to set this up best i can to show you the piston now is at bottom dead center so you've got the piston at the top the piston at the bottom so with the piston at the bottom we'll have a look at where the cam is now if you look you'll see there that the inlet cam is still really quite open in fact if i open if i undo the spark plug I bet we can see it. We've got a torch. Perhaps a bit of preparation wouldn't have gone amiss. Yeah, we can. There's the inlet valve. That's the seat at the back of the inlet valve. Uh, <laughs> so, at bottom dead centre now, um, the valve is is wide open you know the, the cam the exhaust inlet cam is still open this is because we have a lot of speed in the engine so we're trying to predict how things are going to go and because it's happening so fast we give it time so we leave the inlet valve open on on the hope that the speed of the air is still going in and of course that bottom dead center the piston because the crank angle is so gentle it hasn't moved much but well what we'll do next is we'll move the the crank position round to where I've measured where I get a clearance under the inlet valve and that is that point see where it says C on there so C means that now you can see the inlet valve is off lift so I've got a clearance now which means the valve is shut so from this point onwards the pistons done maybe a third of its travel from this point onwards the piston is compressing the air but not before and that's where this bit of a picture goes in. So you can see uh, the point inlet valve closes. So the piston has actually traveled, if we call that 70, it's actually traveled 21 millimeters 
um, up the bore before it starts compressing. So if we want to work out the dynamic compression ratio, we take into account when it's actually squashing, which is from 49 mil. So if we do a, another calculation, which I've not done on here, which is basically 49 mil by 69.5, which is the stroke, it comes out at 843 cc's the engine. Divide that by four, that gives us 211, which is obviously the cc's per pop. That plus the 24.9 equals the 235.9. Divide it again by what we're squashing it into, which is 24.9. So the dynamic compression ratio is, is 9.4 to one, which, you know, it's quite low, isn't it? So all this stems back from like, God, what year would it be? Maybe 1999, 2000. I bought a Tony Hatcher engine and um, the, ha the engine was in my imp. I did the first two seasons with it <laughs> and then I rebuilt it. And the first time after I rebuilt it, it blew up. But that's another story. Now, I did eventually catch up with Tony Hatcher at an imp club meeting and I spoke to him and I said, you know, I want to make my imp go well. And he said, have you measured your compression ratio? And I said, no. He said, well, I'll give you a tip. He said, if you want your imp to go well with an R23 cam, you need 13 to one static compression. Now, I didn't even know what he meant at this point in my life. I was just like, right, okay, thanks for that. But I remembered what he said. And it's only like 25 years later on that I actually understand uh, what he was talking about. So he knew that for the imp being such a small engine, because the dynamic compression ratio was so low because of the wildness of the camshaft, it had to start out static. So if you imagine that was 13, it'd be like 10. Do you see, because it's all relative. Obviously, with the modern cam profiles that we're using now, because the inlet valve closes earlier, we end up with more of a sweep. So we end up with a higher dynamic on the modern cam profiles. But on these old school Hartwell 410 cam lifts, it's really obvious. You can see why the static has to be so high, just so we could get an half decent dynamic compression ratio. And that's why this engine will probably run loads, it'll run probably, I don't know, 38, 40 degrees advanced without any quibbles at all because the dynamic is so low. So I hope I've not tied myself in too many knots there and confused you all, but um, that's a bit of an insight as to how it works um, with the compression ratio. Now, one thing I'll just touch on very, very quickly is if you can see now why a bigger engine doesn't need to start with 12 and a half to one, if this was say an MGB engine with say 89 mil of stroke, because it's squashing for so much longer, we end up, you know, if you have an 11 to one static uh, on an MGB, even with a wild cam, it might still only be 10 and a half to one dynamic because the, the stroke of the crankshaft is so much more, it's squashing for so much longer. So it's only short stroke race engines with race cams that we can get away with using this sort of compression ratio because most people that aren't into imps when you say you're running 13 or 14 to one they're like oh my god how, how are you doing that that's crazy how do you how do you stop it from detonating well the truth is it's all about working things back from a cylinder pressure a cranking pressure of like 250 260 um, psi on wide open throttle is is where you want to be any higher than that and you end up running into, into detonation issues and an imp even on 13 to one with that cam. In fact, we'll, when we get this on the dyno, we'll, um, we'll measure the compression just out of interest. I bet you it struggles to make 200 uh, PSI on cranking wide open for all. Anyway, we'll do that in a minute. Okay, good morning, YouTubers. I'm on the dyno now with the 1150 from the Hartwell Imp of Peters. And uh, I've just been watching the video that I made for you guys regarding static and dynamic compression ratio. And I was watching it and I thought, well i sort of understand it but then i thought you've missed some key points that might be interesting to the sort of um novice not novice but you know an interested person who doesn't really know about engines so i was gonna just say you know why do i why when why did the chap uh, tony hatcher say to me 13 to 1 compression why was compression ratio so important and the reason is is because the compression ratio is the main factor that, that dictates burn speed. So we squash the air, we squash the fuel in the air, sorry. It goes bang inside the chamber here and it pushes the piston down and the connecting rod um, transfers that energy into the crankshaft and pushes the crankshaft round, which is 
eventually attach the back wheels which makes you uh, go forward unless of course you've got a french car or a modern ford where it's on the front wheels but we'll talk about rear wheels for the time being anyway i'm losing the plot again right so what i wanted to say was the compression ratio is the main factor that it takes per burn speed we want the fuel to burn as fast as possible but as it before it detonates so it, uh, it's called a deflagration where it burns and expands and there's no shock wave when it goes into detonation we get a shock wave and we see pistons being eaten and things like that a lot of heat being produced gaskets suffer heads get eaten etc now the reason why we want the burn speed as fast as possible is because the burn speed is a constant like we just said it's set by the compression ratio the fuel mixture etc but mainly the compression ratio or the cylinder pressure should i say the amount of times it's squashed the more the more you squash it the more volatile it becomes now the engine has a massive range of uh, rpm so it, it runs from idle all the way through to 9000 rpm so time becomes a massive factor like we saw with the inlet valve which is left open for the first 20 mil of the stroke on the compression stroke because it's all happening so fast we've got to try and predict <laughs> what what the engine's going to want to make it work because it takes time for things to happen like the advance we see the spark is sparked before the piston gets to top dead well what's that all about because you'd think it does push it back the wrong way but because it takes time for the burn to happen we have to start the spark before top dead center in the hope that the maximum um, expansion of gases takes place just after top dead center and we get the maximum push to get the most energy out of the burn so that's why we chase compression ratio because we want the best speed because the more speed we can have out of the burn the more power we can get out of the engine at high rpm remember it's always about the work done so you know we, we want the, the, the more bangs per minute you can get out of an engine producing good power the better horsepower you'll see right i'm not going to go much further because i probably fried the average guy's brain with that so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to put the i did make a bit of a flippant comment before in the last video about this engine will struggle to make 200 psi compression despite being 12 to 1 but because the cam's so wild the dynamics quite low well what we're going to do next is we'll put the camera on the stand we've got the compression tester ready this is just a dead simple pressure gauge we screw it into here like that and what we do is we just measure the cylinder pressure on cranking with the throttle wide open now it's really important the throttle's wide open because we need the end the air to be able to be pushed into the engine when the piston goes down if it doesn't get if it, if it, if it has a closed throttle it has to it has a vacuum so when the when the piston goes down the air can't get into the engine so that's what and we're going to do before now. i set the um tripod up with the with for the doing the compression test i thought i'd give you an update on where we're up to because as you know mr benoit is going to want his engine back uh, come monday tuesday next week so i uh, yesterday i managed to get the liners um bored so we bored them <laughs> that's the remainder there's his old liners and then at the moment we've got the the new liners in the block and i bought it it's ready for honing and i'm just giving it a minimum lick now i'm only doing like 80 rpm there but the reason for that is we've got dissimilar metals so we've got the iron and the alley and what we want is we want the tool to cut both materials and not ride it i have tried to do this faster in the past and what happens is the tool rides over the iron and then digs into the alley so you don't end up with it perfectly flat so i'm just doing it dead slow it takes a few hours to chew the top of it off but once it's chewed off it'll be good and we can get hopefully get that honed and clean today ready for a build over the weekend and then um, monday we'll run it okay ready to do the compression test i've uh, screwed the tester into the block so i know ring at the bottom and that swivel so I'll set that up so you guys can see it. Clean it even, perhaps. Is that as clean as it gets? Right. I'm not sure whether you can see. I'll tell you what the figures are anyway. So I'm going to hold the throttle open down here. And we'll wind it over. Right. 175 PSI on number one. 
pretty much what I expect it to be with this wild cam. Now, if we just change the camshaft on this engine and put one of um, my Bob, Bob Jones modern grinds in it, because the cam's got less duration and it's wilder, it's tamer, um, as in the inlet valve was shut earlier, we'd see a lot higher compression pressures on cranking. <laughs> Okay, so that one is about 180. So slightly better for number two. But still, you know, I'm, I'm looking, as long as we see no more than 10 PSI difference, I'm quite happy with that. It means the engine's fit and all the valves are seating nicely. Rings have all bedded in. <laughs> That was number three. That's um, 175 again. So, as long as this one's 175, or well, between 170 and 180, I think we're happy that the engine's in a in a fit state. <laughs> Okay, so 175 again for number four. So I've not actually had the head off this engine. Um, as Peter had just rebuilt the engine, um, and it was a problem with the bottom end as to why I was looking at it. So we're gonna put the plugs back in now and we'll get a tune out of this and uh, do a little video of it. Okay, YouTubers, we're on the dyno now with the 1150, the Hartwell engine, the original 1150 Hartwell of Peter's. I've just been giving him some gentle runs. I've not put loads of advance in, put about 30 degrees in max. Just to see how we, uh, I don't think that'll be too much for it. Just to just, uh, get an idea of where we're at. And he's, uh, he's very friendly. Considering he's got that Hartwell 410 cam, he's remarkably friendly. He says that he won't pick up now. Let go, Dino. So, I'm not gonna go too crazy because I've not had the whole engine apart, so I've not expected pistons valves and springs and stuff like that.
Michael. I'm just going to make a little video all about you and your race in Hillman. I'm just going to do a walk around if that's okay. This is Mike Loveland's car. We interviewed Mike the other week at um, Donington Park. So I've just come to see him today because his engine wasn't built very well and it had an oil leak. <laughs> Isn't that right, Mike? Yeah, apparently so. Some, some, some chunky some, northerner. Some, yeah, slack northerner built it. So, yeah, some slack northerner. So we took the engine, well, Mike very kindly took the engine out and ran me and said there's oil behind the flywheel. Now, obviously, I wouldn't send the engine out with an oil leak uh, after being dynoed. So we've had a look at it, and I suspect it's been um, coming out from one of the uh, the location dial on the, on, the, on the back of the crankshaft and, and oozing out behind the flywheel because... I can't imagine the seal would have an issue. Anyway, we've changed the seal anyway, Michael, haven't we? We have. And we've had a look at the ignition and a few other bits and pieces, and it's all ready to go on together. I'll give you a lift putting it in. So what do you reckon about three o'clock it'll be running? No, because you told me to let the uh, silicon go off. Oh, I did, didn't I? Yeah, so yeah. It will be running Saturday. Saturday would be good. Yeah. yeah, Saturday would be good. Right. Well, uh, thanks for letting me make a little video. Just as I'll have no, I'll have no, nothing to put on Sugar Cube on Sunday night because all I've done this week is um, is, is jaunt around. Okay, cool. YouTubers, I'm just joined with by Nick here. Nick owns this stock car, which his daughter races in the uh, V8 Hot Stocks, and he's come down because he's he's trying a few different things. What are you up to, Nick? We're just trying a new different sort of. Fueling system, really. A fueling system. They're trying to get away from the SU carburetors. They normally run a pair of um, early HIF 44s, inch and three quarter SUs, but they have all sorts of problems with the float sticking and stuff like that. So he's gone for a single 45 and made him. That's nice manifold you made there, Nick. Fair play. But I just thought I'd make a little video about it because it just sounds so nice. Um, we've just messed around a bit, putting some bigger jets in, haven't we? Just so we can take it to the rolling road, really, because. Uh, He's going to have to set it up properly before he goes racing. Can you uh, do the honours, Pat, and just give us a fire up? Beautiful. I'm sure all the neighbours around here are absolutely <laughs> ecstatic. <laughs> Yeah, at the uh, the sound of your V8 engine. Thanks for that, Nick. No okay, it's Saturday night. That could only mean one thing. Uh, we're going to Bradford to watch the Formula One stock cars. That's Oldstall Stadium. That's my eldest there, and he very kindly offered to do the video because I like to watch. I can't be bothered with the video. <laughs> anyway, absolutely fantastic night's racing. Thank you so much to all the drivers and everyone that made it happen. A special thank you to Joseph, who is my pal. He was the start man. What a guy. He was absolutely belting all night. A brave man.
Okay, YouTubers, hope you're still awake and you've enjoyed this week's episode. Um, have a great week and I look forward to seeing you next Sunday at 7. Bye for now.